Hello, welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar. We're excited to uh, have you with us. Uh, this is gonna be a really exciting webinar. Um, and so let's go ahead and get into the meat of what we're gonna be discussing today. Um, we're gonna be discussing training with non-motorized treadmills creative program strategies to maximize fitness and sports performance. And we have a really special guest today. His name is Marty Miller. And uh, Marty's actually been with NASM for many years now. Um, he's also the director of education and training for Technogym. He's an NASM regional master instructor. He holds his doctorate in health sciences. He's also a certified athletic trainer. And more than that, he is an NASM content expert. He teaches our workshops. He's CPT, CES, PES. Um, so you're going to learn a lot from Marty. He's a wealth of knowledge and a great guy. My name is Brian Sutton. I'm the content and production manager uh, for NASM. Been with NASM since 2004. So our agenda today is going to be a lot of fun. First, we're going to talk about the science of motorized versus curved treadmills. Then we're going to discuss the impact of curved uh, treadmill training on speed, power, strength, and agility. We'll discuss some exercise possibilities for clients and athletes. And then near the end of the presentation, we'll have a giveaway and promotional offer. And then we'll also answer your questions. So throughout the webinar, uh, if you have questions, use the GoToWebinar questions feature. Uh, we'll be moderating your questions and then they'll all be answered in the end. So uh, I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. It's gonna be a lot of fun. What we're going to do now is go ahead and kick it over to Marty. Marty, thank you for joining us. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to speak to the NASM crowd on such a, what I find a fascinating topic. And, you know, I'm really excited to get into it. So, you know, with uh, all of us here in the fitness industry, obviously science is a very important part of what we do. We obviously want to make the experience fun for all of our customers and give them what they want clearly, but really having a great understanding of the equipment that we're putting them on and the scientific benefits really allows us to then get more creative with the programming, make it more engaging, and then really show our customers why they chose to train with us, whether it's in a format, a, a boutique experience, group training, or one-on-one. -on -one. So as we were looking at the topic, I thought right off the bat, I said, I'd love to talk about the scientific benefits of training with the non-motorized treadmill. People see them in the industry, and sometimes they're either intimidated by them, or they just think that it's only for sprint training, and the science behind it really doesn't come across. So that was why we picked today's topic. Awesome. Hey, Marty, we're, we're not seeing your screen. So if you okay. could help us with some technical difficulties and just share your screen with us. Let's take a look here. One second. Um, bear with us, folks. It looks like we're having just a, a little bit of technical difficulties getting Marty's uh, PowerPoint up on the screen, but we'll we'll get this resolved here in just a few minutes. Um, okay, here we go. There's my webcam. Like we're almost there. Awesome. Thank you, Marty. Perfect. Awesome. Excellent. So on we go. Excellent. So let's start with a little history of Technogym. So Technogym is a world leader in equipment and solution um, in the fitness industry. So the headquarters is in Cesena, Italy, and the company was founded by Nerio Alessandri in his garage. So you can see there, there was his first piece of equipment and you can tell from the name Techno and Gym that from the very early stages, he had a vision of blending the greatest technology with fitness equipment. And that's where we've come to today. So now this is what we call the new garage. So this is our international headquarters in Cesena, Italy, where we have over 250 people working in research and design alone. So that's what really allows Technogym to come out with such innovative products, game-changing type products that bring things into the marketplace that other people just can't uh, produce and offer to you know, all of you in the fitness industry. So that's where we're gonna talk about the science that has come from the skill mill or the non-motorized treadmill. So Technogym is proud to be the sole provider of equipment for the last seven Olympic games. And the reason I like to bring that up is 
not only did Technogen provide the equipment, it was one of the largest or the largest case study in human performance. And you'll see that when we talk about the skill mill today and the curve non-motorized tremo, where this inspiration really came from. Because athletes need to train specifically for desired outcomes. They can't just afford to do random exercise. They have to have very specific training programs. So Technogym being the sole provider was tasked with creating a cardiovascular line that could meet all of the challenges and demands of the world's greatest athletes. And as all of us know that work in the fitness industry, that a lot of the research that eventually comes into the fitness industry starts in the world's greatest areas such as human performance in professional sports or Olympic or highly trained athletes. And that's what we see here with the product that we're going to talk about today, that non-motorized curved treadmill. So moving into the industry now, and in, you know, we know that the biggest uh, um, fads, and I will not even say fad, let me rephrase that, the biggest trends in industry now is the higher intensity training. That definitely has a place within fitness. But you know, that, that is so popular now because people want to be inspired to what we will call free that athlete within. We're going to go through different capacities of training. But again, everyone needs to train like an athlete to their level whether it's very modified and it's a single leg hop to balance or whether it's full blown plyometrics or compound lifts, everyone has those capacities and they need to challenge themselves to train within those and improve their abilities. And again, the more that the fitness professional can move their clients towards training like an athlete within their abilities, the more engagement, the more fun they're gonna have and the more results they're gonna see. And that's why we see such a move towards the higher intensity training in the industry today. So I always like to say everybody's an athlete. So it doesn't matter who comes in to train or you know, when I was doing more one-on-one -on -one training or when we're lecturing and training all of these great fitness professionals, we want everyone to focus on their clients in one way. Every single person they come across and train is an athlete. Again, their abilities will be far ranging, of course, based on their current fitness level, their desires, their goals, their injuries in the past or things that they're overcoming, but everyone can improve their athletic abilities. So when we look at the world's greatest athletes, and this was coming from the case study in human performance at the Olympic Games, is there four main pillars that all athletes need to train in at some time. Now, clearly, depending on what time of year it is and their sports season, they might really focus and peak in those capacities for an event. But when we look at fitness, all of our clients should be developing some level of speed, some level of power, some level of agility, and some level of stamina at all times. But with that, there has to be an underlying focus on proper human movement. So that's that flexibility, strength, and stability, that foundation of quality movement. And then from there, you can really focus in on those four pillars and the four capacities of human performance. And again, I'll reiterate it again. Anyone that you train has those capacities. Those are human capacities. It's just what is their ability to produce speed? What is their ability to produce power? What does their agility look like? And what's their stamina? So as long as we have a great training program based on the fundamental principles of proper human movement, everyone can develop and improve in those four capacities, especially if they're on a specific training program rather than just random exercise. So when we look at the curved non-motorized treadmill, Technogym makes the skill mill, which is a premium curved non-motorized treadmill, and we have the multi-drive, which allows us to seamlessly through the resistance train in all four of those capacities. So now we're gonna talk about the scientific applications and what is really occurring in the body when someone goes on the skill mill and when they train in those different capacities. So again, having the multi-drive technology allows someone to go seamlessly from speed into agility, into stamina, or into power training. Now again, here we're seeing an individual running. Depending on the environment you work in, I had worked in professional sports, I also worked in private country clubs, so again, my athletes ranged in age from 7 to 77 in all kinds of abilities. But speed could be, of course, top-end sprinting speed at 15, 16 miles an hour, or it could simply be having someone introduced to the skill mill or a curb non-motorized treadmill 
and they're walking at 1.7 miles an hour and then after they're trained and they're starting to see an increase in their performance, now they can comfortably walk at 2.2 miles an hour. Agility could be all of the stuff that you'll see here, whether they're skipping, whether they're doing side shuffle, doing karaoke, or it could be simply walking and starting with your hands holding on to the skill mill and then eventually being able to walk without having to hold on. That's still an improvement in someone's agility. Then obviously for stamina, it's can they stay on the uh, curved non-motorized treadmill for longer periods of time. And then obviously power, we can throw on the magnetic resistance and create a run against resistance or a sled push. So all four of those capacities can be trained simultaneously, just transitioning right through any uh, training protocol you want to put together for your clients. So now that we're speaking to the NASM crowd, clearly every one of you will understand what I mean by this. So when we look at the phases of training, which we'll talk about and show here shortly, is majority of people that come into your facilities, they're going to come in and ask for the bigger engine. They're going to want to potentially run faster, burn more calories, increase their power. They may not come in and say, you know what, I really need you to help train me in deceleration. They might understand that they're not as fluid in their running and change of direction, but most everybody, especially now that are in the fitness, now that there's the high intensity out there, they want to train like an athlete. So in their mind, they want the bigger engine. Well, what I love about the skill mill and the non-motorized treadmill is we're going to talk about this in a little more detail is now I can really work on the better brakes. So we all know the research that shows that the majority of non-contact injuries occur during deceleration and then change of direction. So again, if they can get going very fast, and let's say they're using a motorized treadmill, and now they need want to do some interval training, and they what we'll call jump the rails, they jump off the moving treadmill, jump on the side rails because they can't transition the motor quick enough to decelerate at a comfortable pace. They're missing one of the biggest factors that they need in training is can they decelerate the speed? I'm never impressed with somebody that can accelerate without decelerating. So this skill mill and the curved non-motorized treadmills are beautiful for that because as you accelerate, you can decelerate in real time as well. And we'll go through some of the science and some of the training programs and all of those, and we'll have leave time for questions and answers at the end. But the beauty of this is it's gonna accelerate and decelerate as you would outside or in you know real life. So now only, you know, not only do we get to increase our ability to do top end speed, and again, that can be a walk or a run or a jog or a sprint, but I'm also now being able to decelerate myself. So it's one of my favorite benefits from working on the curve non-motorized. So now when we look at the NASM OPT model and we look at the skill mill, that curved non-motorized treadmill, is where does it fit? Well, the beauty of it is it can fit in all three phases of training. And I'm not even talking about the cardiovascular components of the OPT model yet. We can get there. But when we look at stabilization, if we take someone that has um, some gait issues, lack of balance and control, and again, this could be a wide ranging, whether it's a young individual that's learning running mechanics, whether it's someone who's been sedentary for a long period of time and you know now they've got tight hip flexors, weak glutes, and now they shuffle. And again, it's not even more about age. We'll show some rehab videos, or even if it's our higher level athletes, the fact that they have to decelerate themselves will help with that stabilization. So it's very easy to do drills where you have them walk or get into a light jog or to their run slowly, and then you let them slow themselves down. And you can do buildups. So you let them have a a longer time to slow themselves down or a longer time to stop. And then what you do is you start to decrease the amount of time that you let them decelerate. So they have to be able to stabilize and control their body even quicker and with more force. Then from a strength standpoint, you can add a little resistance and do some running against resistance. And then for power, clearly throw on more resistance and do that sled push whether it's a high sled push or what you saw pictures of where it's more that football sled push. So again, the non-motorized curve treadmill fits beautifully in the entire model. And then again, you're going to see some images here towards the end where you can work all three planes of motion. Obviously, we know that everyone's dominant in the sagittal plane, but you can do that to start off with. You can do retro walking. So now you're getting some sagittal plane 
walking backwards. You can do some side shuffles to get frontal plane. You can do karaoke to get that transverse plane. So in one piece, you can train all three levels of the model and you can train all three planes of motion. So now we're gonna go through some of the key elements of the skill mill that I think a lot of people don't pick up on when they're first introduced to a non-motorized treadmill. So what I love to talk about is I call it an auto-correcting piece of equipment. And what I mean by that is on a motorized treadmill, and there's always a purpose and a place for a motorized treadmill, but let's assume for now you're working with a more senior population and they don't have the best gait and they shuffle a little bit. If they go on a motorized treadmill, all they have to do is pick up their feet. It does not matter what their form and technique is and the belt will pass underneath them and they are walking for a period of time. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're increasing their activity. They're showing the enjoyment to come into a fitness center. But all of us as scientists, when we work with somebody, we want them to obviously enjoy it. We wanna fix things. So it is near impossible to be on a non-motorized treadmill like the skill mill and shuffle. You have to open up your gate. You don't even have to coach it. They will figure out very quickly that those short little choppy steps are not going to get the deck and belt moving. So that's why we use the term auto correcting. Now, the other thing, too, is they're going to have to go into more triple extension to propel themselves. And again, we can go even into more and more biomechanics. They're going to have to go into more dorsiflexion on the front side of their mechanics. So you're getting, again, what I like to call that accidental exercise. They're activating their anterior tip. Now on the backside, they're getting more hip extension. So you're getting more glute activation. Then if they're not holding on, we know from EMG studies, there's more core activation. So all of this happens without any coaching, with very little cueing. And now again, it's an auto-correcting piece of equipment. Now we take someone that wants to get top end speed. When you're running on the skill mill, if you want to run faster, you will intuitively improve your biomechanics you will intuitively reach out in front of you, grab the front of that deck and pull yourself at a faster, higher turnover rate to increase your speed. Again, it takes very little coaching, it's very intuitive, where if you're on a motorized treadmill, as long as you hit the speed button, the deck will go faster for you, the belt, and as long as you're picking up your feet quickly enough, your form and technique do not have to be the thing that's propelling you, it's just can you stay moving with that deck, uh, moving belt quick enough so again, when we look at form and technique, the skill mill is perfect for a lot of those intuitive, auto-correcting, accidental exercises as I like to talk about it. So improve posture, improve core activation, and then improve triple extension and also improve dorsiflexion on the front side. And then we definitely get a increased stride length as well. So when we look at cognitive training, so what happens cognitively when an individual is on the skill mill? So again, talking to so many fitness professionals right now, you all are very well aware of how the body learns new movement patterns. So the brain is hardwired and it can constantly be rewired. So that's why we purposely have multi-joint exercises, functional exercises where it's not always and only just selectorized pieces of equipment. There's pur uh, purpose for that, of course, in the model, but we want people to be better movers and be more efficient. So I like to say, and I stole this from the book Spark, neurons that fire together, wire together. So again, it, imagine if I'm spending more time on the skill mill working on my walking or running mechanics that movement pattern is now starting to be memorized. So imagine in the hands of all of you that understand the right movement preparation, corrective exercise, or you know, stabilization, strength, power, workouts, and now they go on the skill mill for whatever one of those capacities you wanna train, now you're really enforcing those proper human movement patterns by having them work on the non-motorized treadmill versus only spending time maybe on a motorized treadmill. Now, also from a cognitive standpoint, so again, depending on who you work with, not everyone's gonna work with professional athletes, not everyone's gonna work with young and inspiring athletes, but let's take more of that, that senior population that so many of us work with, and I love working with that population. So I like to call it either the country club athlete or the senior athlete, because again, we're gonna go back to those four capacities. So now one of the biggest things that we're faced with in the fitness industry is the cognitive and functional declines, whether it's Parkinson's dementia and things like that. So the research really, really shows that increased heart rate for at least 20 minutes is wonderful to either prevent as we're aging 
or to combat and possibly reverse the ages of these neurodegenerative diseases. So what the research shows is it's not only 20 minutes of cardiovascular workout, it's 20 minutes of cardiovascular work when you are engaged mentally. So again, if there's a book out there you wanna read, read Spark by John Raddy, and that's really a great entryway into some of this cognitive fitness. And there's more and more coming out, of course. But the beauty of it is that a lot of people, when they go on their cardiovascular, they purposely kind of mentally check out. Now, I'm always going to take activity over no activity, but being the true scientist that all of us are, we're trying to maximize the benefits for our clients. So imagine instead of just sitting on a recumbent bike every time someone comes in and they're just kind of, you know, drifting and letting their mind clear, when there's a point in time that that's just as important. But have, if any of you have worked on this piece of equipment, you cannot mentally check out why you're on the skill mill. You are very focused. So the research shows that that's the way the brain is supposed to learn and improves its performance. Again, if you get into a lot of the research, you can go back to what I'll call the caveman theory is when our brains were designed, it's from survival and we learn by moving, not by sitting. So the brain is very in tune with creating neural connections why we're moving with understanding what's going on in the environment around us. So I really truly believe that the skill mill in the hands of all of the fitness professionals on this webinar like yourselves, then understanding how to create those new and engaging programs for that population, I really think we can make a huge impact in that part of the industry. Again, look at your athletes. They need to be able to focus when they're fatigued or potentially if you work with athletes maybe coming back from concussions. All of this uh, great information that we're sharing here can be perfect for anybody that uh, wants to add that type of training into their program from a cognitive standpoint. So now we'll move into a couple other different benefits. So when we look at curved treadmills versus motorized treadmills, the research shows clearly that there's more cardiovascular demand on a curved treadmill versus the motorized. And again, it's very simple to understand. I'm propelling myself and having to control my balance and coordination more so than on a motorized treadmill. So when you look at the research at 50, 65, and 80% of the lactate threshold, the oxygen uptake is higher and the heart rate uh, with the blood lactate levels are higher as well as um, perceived rate of exertion. So again, the beauty of that is if you're in a hurry, you need to you know, be more efficient with your workout and train in a shorter time period, the skill mill, the curved non-motorized is a great way to do it. If you're trying to create an experience where people are getting on and off equipment, you know, more of that boutique experience, again, a great way to add to that. Or if you're just simply wanting to burn more calories and be more cardiovascular fit, the, here's an answer for it. So all the research is showing that the non-motorized treadmills have a beautiful place in the cardiovascular space for a lot of reasons. And this is just a little bit of the research here at the different lactate thresholds. You can see the heart rate was higher on the curved treadmills versus the motorized treadmills at the same percentage of lactate threshold. So where this is perfect is for the high intensity training environments, any type of performance training. And again, performance training can be, again, someone going from 1.7 to 2.5 miles an hour walking. Let's not always think that it has to be running. So again, helps control a lot of wasted time on, on traditional cardiovascular pieces, helps individuals train efficiently in shorter periods of time. And then again, we put our business hat on. It's definitely helpful in attracting new prospective members because of the I'll call forced engagement. It's just a conversation piece. So when your staff is educated on all these awesome training protocols and features of the skill mill, it forces an interaction with the membership, which intuitively now gives you the ability to bond and create relationships with your members and then offer them different types of services that you may have in your facility. So I already talked about the auto correcting or the activities of daily living. So again, we can spend a lot of time on um, many of these, but again, this could be walking, this could be running. There's so many different features that we could talk about, but just because the individual can naturally and spontaneously change their speed on the skill mill versus the majority of motorized treadmills that are out there, this is more of what's gonna happen in real life. 
So again, from a rehab standpoint, if you're a corrective exercise specialist or aspire to that, you can look at how you can use this with a sled push or the different features. And I'll show a couple of those on how you can really improve things from a rehab standpoint or injury prevention standpoint. Again, you know, focusing on, you know, somebody that, uh, again, they might struggle walking at 1.7 miles an hour. Imagine if they're, you know, hustling and bustling in uh, New York City and they have to hustle across the street. Think of the advantages of them having spent time on a non-motorized like the skill mill versus maybe a motorized. So, again, this just comes up to your creativity, understanding the science that you all do understanding the evidence-based model that you guys work with in every day, and then just having a deeper dive and understanding of what the skill mill can do with your background with the NASM model, of course. So again, it's perfect for that high intensity training environment. Definitely for, again, improved performance any, in any of the capacities to any level and ability. Definitely helps focus on the deceleration training. Definitely helps for the elimination to jump the rails a much higher carryover to activities of daily living from if they're a weekend warrior, if they're trying to train for any type of mud run or 5K, half marathon, marathon. And then it's wonderful for interval training of any sort. So now we'll look at the muscle activation research. So when training on the motorized treadmill and the non-motorized, we saw a little bit of a difference. So training on motorized treadmill showed increase in concentric hamstring strength and a decrease in quadriceps strength. So that ratio was off. So on the other hand, subjects who trained on the curved treadmill revealed a slight increase in, a, in um, the concentric hamstring strength and a greater increase in concentric quad strength. So having the right ratio. So that way, as you're propelling yourself in real life, the skill mill has a very high carryover to how the lower body is going to propel yourself in real life activities. So again, our job as fitness professionals is to prepare our client for the everyday world. So imagine if they're coming in to train with you and they want to play softball on the weekends or run, like I said, the half marathon or 5K, there's definitely a point in time where getting them on the skill mill or the curved treadmills definitely will have a carryover to their movement patterns. And all of us know we don't train muscles, we train movement patterns. So this is exciting research to show that there's a great carryover into the proper movement patterns of triple flexion, triple extension on the curved non-motorized treadmills. So again, where this plays into the fitness space, it's great from preparing people for the proper movement patterns that we all want to go through in every day. Again, focusing on that triple extension, triple flexion, and definitely helps prevent injuries, focusing on the deceleration training again. And before the webinar kicked off, I was talking to Brian. So, you know, I was working, had the privilege of working with some of our military groups and, you know, they do a lot of running on motorized treadmill and sneakers, or they do some running outside with sneakers, but they could get shipped off to any foreign country at any time and have to maybe run in rough terrain sand with their boots on. Well, it's a total different type of biomechanical running. And they've all mentioned when I was speaking with them that, yeah, man, when we go to uh, deployment and we're running differently, if we haven't been around sand, et cetera, you know, it definitely changes things and there's an increase in injury and soreness. So whether you're working with somebody that maybe is in the military or if you're working with somebody that wants to, again, compete in some of these amazing fitness events that we have out there now, like Tough Mudders, Spartan races, this is going to give them a much more real feel. All you got to do is put on a little bit of the magnetic resistance. There's 10 different levels. And now they're getting some of that movement pattern in a progressive way with the right level of resistance to prepare them for what they're going to see in their true activity that they're going to be training for. So another way to look at the skill mill is we can take it from function to action and action to an ability an ability to training from training to sport and then sport to performance. And I've already really highlighted this with all of your backgrounds with the NASM model going from stabilization, strength to power, as well as the three planes of motion. So this is what you do every single day. But now instead of doing it, maybe just with body weight and dumbbells and kettlebells and the bands and the traditional resistance training protocols. Now, hopefully we can open you up to understand how you can create those same type of progressions using a piece like the skill mill. So now again, with the NASM model, we're going to go 
take a look at more, okay, how would we use this in corrective? Very easy to see in the PES performance world, top end speed, high level power. Well, what can we do now from a corrective exercise strategy? Because as we all know, so many of our clients need some type of uh, correction in their movement dysfunction. And can the skill mill be a piece of that? So absolutely. So we're gonna move into that realm for a few minutes. So we've already talked about the increased muscle activation. So hopefully I've had the privilege of working with a bunch of you in the past at either any of the trade shows or conferences. But as we all know, it's going to be hard to find an, um, a client with overactive glutes. We just know that historically the majority of people are going to have tight hip flexors, which now will inhibit the glutes, which inhibits the whole lower body movement pattern. We know the majority of people are going to have a lack of dorsiflexion and core activation. So like I said, if we can get them on a piece like this where they have to fire their core more, they have to intuitively fire their glute, which changes their whole movement pattern. And this has nothing with what they would have done with you, of course. This is just by them accidentally learning how to use the skill mill. So with that extra EMG studies that have been performed showing such a higher activation in the posterior chain, especially as it gets into the glutes firing and then the hamstrings firing at the right sequence to propel themselves, we just know automatically if they're going to do their cardio and we're trying to fix them and get them to move better, why would we not want them to spend some time doing these type of exercises to just re truly reinforce that glute activation? Now, another really cool uh, piece of the research that came out is the sled push feature. Now, when you look at the sled push on the skill mill, it's different than what you see in the traditional gym in some angles where people are bent over at 90 degrees at the waist. Now, not saying not to do those type of sled pushes, but when I look at choosing exercise, I'm looking for most bang for the buck. So I like the higher handle sled push for simply the main reason is we know we get better glute activation. When you're bent over at 90 degrees, the glute activation is not as high. You're going to get a different little bit of a firing pattern. You're still going to burn calories, still going to definitely do a lot of performance. But again, it depends what we're trying to target. So you'll see here with that high sled push position, or even when the individuals wrap their arms around and place their shoulders against the skill mill, they're still in more of that upright position. And what I really love about that is being an athletic trainer, always worrying about risk to reward. How do I decrease chance of injury? Why increase performance and, act, and uh, their ability to perform and move through a progression without injury is if we look here, the sled push shows levels of activation as high as glute targeted exercises such as squats, deadlifts, and sumo squats. Now, absolutely, if your clients can handle those exercises and you feel comfortable, I love those exercises. But when you look intuitively of the wide ranging of individuals we work with, how many people can properly do those under load, especially for in the strength or power when you're doing it explosively, like a squat can be a jump squat, obviously. So you've got your deadlifts and sumo squats, which would be more in that strength phase, max strength potentially. Obviously, those are higher challenging exercises, more chance of potential injury. Well, everyone can do some level of sled push, even if it's on the magnetic resistance level one. Again, take the individual that's walking at 1.7 miles an hour to maybe 2.5. They may never maximize the amount of magnetic resistance on the skill mill but maybe they do a sled push at level three and their wattage goes from 30 watts to 70 to 90. They've tripled their lower body power, but we know from the EMG studies, they're getting it through the right movement patterns. So again, just, you know, all of you who are such high level fitness professionals, the, um, I can just imagine what you could do with some of this, where maybe you use the sled push as a pre-activation technique where we look into the PAP, post-activation potentiation. Maybe you have them do a five second sled push and then they go do a deadlift. So there's so many different things you can do with it or you use it for someone that's coming off of an injury and you know that they need, they're not ready to control any type of load on their spine, but you really do want to get those glutes fired up. So that's a sled push is again, another way that you can target that. So again, just use your creativity, understand where the science is, uh, leaning us towards the benefits of the skill mill and now do that in your everyday program as you normally would. So again, I already touched on this. We know that it's gonna increase metabolic rate. Again, it doesn't have to be a run. So someone walking at 1.5, 
1.8 miles an hour on a non-motorized is going to increase their metabolic rate over someone walking at 1.8 on a motorized. So again, the, the miles per hour to me doesn't matter. It's just that we know that we're going to improve their cardiovascular output with all those other benefits at a higher level than if they were doing a traditional motorized treadmill. Now, another great research that uh, a piece that came out, especially when we're looking at the high intensity world where people are increasing their volume a lot and we need to be careful of overloading people or for people that are coming off injury is the results are showing that while the forefoot pressure were no different on the different treadmills, the rear foot were significantly less on the curved treadmill. So they're getting more into triple extension so there's less load, but they're also now getting that more muscle activation that we're looking for. So you can see all the different studies here, but the beauty of it is improved performance, decreased risk of injury. And if there's, you know, like I said, I always say I'm always looking to do no harm when I'm training individuals. So this speaks right to that there, that I can improve their movement patterns, improve their cardiovascular, their power, and decrease the chance of injury. So we'll show a couple videos here. So you can see here how much further he can get into a full gait cycle. He can truly get that increased dorsiflexion on that right leg and then drive all the way back. And you'll see that increased rear foot activation and how that takes him into triple extension. So again, it could be some, something this simple where you're getting that long engaged stride. So here's just another view of it. Now they're doing more like the skateboard push where they're focusing on one leg and just really teaching them that neuromuscular re-education in that partial weight bearing. And you can see how wonderfully he gets into that triple extension. Now this wasn't one of my clients. I don't know how far after surgery this was, but you can see how what a great tool this would be. Now, again, on the display, see what they do and what their wattage is, you can start comparing right versus left to know if they're getting back to their normal function. So, again, it's great also for that partial weight bearing. So, again, just another shot here. You can see, again, this individual's holding on. So, an increase in agility. Would, could they maintain that posture? Could they maintain that gait cycle without changing their speed? And maybe they hold on either with one hand or no hands, or maybe just kind of instead of that grasp that you see there, maybe just a gentle, um, you know, touching the scale mill. So that way, again, there's a little more proprioceptive demand. So again, these are things you guys do each and every day, but just trying to point out some of the cool features. So now when we look at more corrective exercise and how we progress people through rehab. You can see here that first of all, we're going to correct any of the deviations. This is something you guys are familiar with each and every day. Then we're going to go into flexibility, mobility, starting to improve range of motion, etc. Then we'll get into that strength and endurance, improving proper human movement, starting to add a little bit of load, obviously always adding in balance, etc moving up you know into different progressions coordination and agility then you can get into the functions which really gets more into those starting to move to those four capacities of power agility speed and stamina and then you're looking for a performance improvement in those capacities so again this pyramid will look different for every individual but again very similar to how you look at things every day as an NESM certified personal trainer so we can look at the gait facilitation, increasing muscle activation, again, that partial weight bearing, promoting proper biomechanics while progressing towards full weight bearing, working from that gait to running progression. Again, remember it's auto correcting, so it takes a lot less coaching. And then again, you go from their ability towards a sport progression, again, whatever their capacities uh, you wanna focus on within improving their ability. So again, some other unique features is just a simple power walk. So again, it doesn't have to be getting anyone ever towards a run. So we know power walking shows increased activation that posts to your chain. And again, we already went over the increased metabolic demand. So again, for those who have worked on motorized treadmill and they don't quite get the calorie burn they want or the inc increased heart rate, but they don't feel comfortable running, now that power walk, either they walk very quickly on the skill mill or maybe walk 
as quick as they can with just a tiny bit of magnetic resistance solves that problem for people who do not want to run. Or if you're looking at a progression and it's time to unload somebody and you don't want them running, but you still want to improve that cardiovascular demand, you have the ability to use power walking in that as well. So then the sled push, obviously the using it on the skill mill is there's no need for large spaces. You're not loading and unloading weight. So it's very easy to do in tandem and intervals and have people jump on, jump off. There's a, that seamless transition between the users, very safe application for everybody you're gonna train for power for lower body. And again, you're getting data. So not only on the uh, traditional sled push, you know how far you push the sled and what the weight was, but you never saw what wattage, because if I did it in three seconds less, there would be an increase in wattage. You're not gonna get that data on a traditional sled. So now on the scale mill, you'll see your peak wattage as well. So again, just getting that extra data with all of the other benefits. Now you can add the accessory kit and do a sled pull as well. So it's not just the uh, sled push, you can now do retro work and do sled pull and do intervals as well. And again, we all know the different biomechanical factors that go into retro walking. So again, no need for large spaces, no, lead, no need to load and unload weights, that seamless transition. And again, very safe application for any individual that you're training. Our firemen, our military love doing the drags as well, or anyone that just wants to, again, train like an athlete and improve their performance. Also, now we can do lateral push. Now, again, if we had the accessory kit, doesn't mean you couldn't have a handle there, use one handle at a time and do a lateral pull, but you could also do lateral pushes. So again, don't think of the skill mill just as a sagittal plain piece of equipment. You can be very creative when you're using the curved non-motorized treadmills. So it allows for multiple planes of motion, challenging agility from a performance standpoint and challenges movement patterns for increased targeting demand. So again, you got the corrective exercise background, you wanna do things in the frontal plane, or from a performance standpoint, you know that it's time to do a little more agility or power in the frontal plane. So however you wanna use it, it's just, again, an endless opportunities with all of your education and background. Now, agility work. Again, no need for large spaces. So again, now instead of having to do bounding and skipping over a period of time and people in a, in a confined space, this allows that seamless transition between multiple users as well. Countless ways to create micro progressions and micro regressions. Again, the auto correcting forces the improved abilities and techniques. And again, it can be anything that you see here from your PES background or simply just teaching someone to walk without having to hold on quite as much is still an improvement in their agility. So you can see here, there's countless variations of things that we've come up with. And again, this is just, some of the exercises and progressions that you could use. So again, you know, think about your progressive model that you've all been trained in from a corrective exercise standpoint, if you've gone through that, through the OPT model going from stabilization strength to power, and then again, if you've taken the advanced credential of the performance enhancement, this can be a piece all along the way, regardless of anybody that comes into your facility. And again, we're showing a lot of sagittal plane, but you'll see some frontal plane and transverse plane here as well. So again, from a scientific standpoint, so many opportunities for you, but then in essence, it's fun, it's engaging, it's different. And as we know, as much as we love the science, our clients wanna have a good time and see different things almost every single time they come in. So this could be a great answer for you. So hopefully, you know, going through all this allows you to look at the non-motorized treadmills differently and understanding the benefit of the skill mill with the magnetic resistance and just opens your eyes up to the countless abilities that you have when you take your science and programming into the skill mill. So I think we have some time for questions and answers. So if Brian, you wanna take control. Brian, I can't hear you just to make sure that. Um...
Brian's just checking his sound. We'll be up with you in just a minute. Thank you for your patience. Using that computer mic. Oh, unfortunately, our uh, our mic went dead. Um, thank you for everything that you just shared. This was uh, this was actually really really informative. Who knew that we could do so much on a non motorized treadmill? Um, you know, I was looking from the outside looking in. You were thinking, you know, treadmill versus a piece of cardiovascular equipment. But now we could do corrective exercise on it. We could do sports conditioning with a uh, a non motorized treadmill. So that's that's really awesome. Just want to get to a couple of uh, questions. What are your thoughts on placing a skill mill in a non-supervised facility? So, for example, maybe it's a it's a it's a gym where personal trainers rent out space and the, the, the clients aren't supervised. Yes. So, you know, without knowing all the details, the one beauty of the skill mill I didn't highlight it is there's a QR code on the inside um, where the phone holder is. So with TechnoGym, you know, we are a fitness equipment manufacturer, but we don't stop there. We're a digital solutions company as well. So we have content on all the pieces of equipment where as long as there's, that we can provide a banner or there's a note saying, hey, log on using the My Wellness app, which is free, hit the QR code, and then right there, you've got a coach at all times. So as long as you can give that information out to whomever's coming in that, if you log in with the My Wellness app, which is free, and you hit the QR code, we have instructional videos right there on a lot of different progressions. So that way, again, it, it's an easy, safe way to you know, offer service to people in a facility that does not have staff constantly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Um, what are the benefits of a non-motorized treadmill? Or treadmill like a tread climber type of equipment. So I guess what they're trying to say is, look at the uh, the non-motorized treadmill and then look at a, a, a tread climber. So a stair stepper that's the, uh, with the revolving. Um, yep. Yeah. Rather than. So, yeah. So I mean, I've seen two different type of tread climbers. I've seen the you know runs that go into the extreme incline and they they are still motorized and the belt's working, or the ones that I've seen some uh, you know where there's. Um, there's a left and right but it's still more of a belt so as long as the you know if the motor's moving it or if there's not a curve to it you're not going to get that proper biomechanics that we talked about you're going to burn calories there's going to be increased heart rate for sure due to the uh, massive incline but there's going to be a point where are we worried about just how many you know like how many calories we burned or are we worried about again human performance improving biomechanics and moving into moving properly if you have someone that's climbing steep inclines as part of their training programs, absolutely, I can see that. But very, you know, very rarely will someone need to train over 20, 25 degree incline because there's going to have to be a change in biomechanics. And now we just have to worry about is there stress to their kinetic chain and what are we trying to accomplish? Just pure exhaustion or improving their performance while we improve their movement patterns. So, you know, there's always a, a point in time for it. I'm not going to say no by any means. It's, the first question is, what are we trying to accomplish? And majority of people just want a great workout. So if, again, if I go back to having a great workout, but also get all that accidental benefit, I'm always going to steer that way. Unless I can say, this is something this person needs to do outside of the gym, then I might say, okay, you know, they're going to have to spend some time on those extreme inclines. But we know biomechanically the body doesn't absorb the force as well during that. Awesome. No, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, as you stated earlier in the presentation, right, one of our jobs as a fitness professional is to do no harm, right? So we want to make, again, a good workout. They're getting a good, they're getting cardiovascular benefits, but we also don't want to add excessive wear and tear on the joints. So that makes a lot of sense. We want them to be able to, you know, I would say fitness is a race with no finish line. Let's not burn them out. Let's improve them. So that way they can continue to train. And, you know, anytime we can save the joints, to me, that's a huge benefit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so I have a question here. You answered it in the webinar. It's, you burn more calories on non-motorized treadmill. I think maybe what this person is asking is why would you burn more calories on a non-motorized treadmill? Is it because of the muscle activation? What, what, what's going on within the physiology uh, yeah. for someone to burn more calories on a non-motorized treadmill? Yeah, I mean, if we're looking at just kind of walking or running, not alone, like talking about sled push, things like that, but just traditional usage is on a motorized treadmill, you can, like, I'm just going to pick a number. Let's say I'm running at seven miles an hour. On a motorized treadmill, am I really running at seven miles an hour or am I keeping up with a moving belt at seven miles an hour? I'm not propelling my body weight at seven miles an hour. So again, there's nothing wrong with training on a motorized treadmill. Just let's understand the science behind it, that there's not going to be a mile per hour carryover is if you had to go run outside. With the skill mill, you are actually propelling yourself at that speed. And due to that, you have to create more muscle activation to do that. So that's where the increased demand comes from because you're truly running that speed yourself. You're not just lifting your body just enough for the belt to pass underneath. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in, your, in your presentation, you actually you talked a lot about uh, triple flexion. And mm -hmm. right, and how the non-motorized treadmill can help promote triple extension, for example. So maybe if we can explain to the audience why is triple extension so important, especially for athletic performance. If I want to improve my sprinting speed, for example. Sure. So you know, all of us being fitness professionals, we talk to our clients and sometimes talk to each other muscle by muscle. But we don't train muscles, we're training a movement pattern. So all of you that have gone through the NASM course, I know you've been tested on front side, back side mechanics. And it doesn't matter if you're walking or running, is as we're running, we need triple flexion, which is hip flexion, knee flexion, ankle dorsiflexion. And then on the back side mechanics, you need extension of your hip, extension of your knee, then plantar flexion, which is extension at the ankle. So, so many people don't have that, even if they are young and athletic, but over time people lose it dramatically from a sedentary lifestyle. So when we're all of a sudden trying to now improve performance, if they don't understand that movement pattern, we have the faulty movement patterns, other muscles kick in to try to assist. We're now stressing the joints because they can't get into their proper biomechanics. So when you're using the steel mill on the non-motorized curve treadmill, you can't help but start to improve that, like I said, accidental exercise or the auto-correcting because the belt won't move until you propel yourself. So intuitively, if you want to walk faster, run faster, you figure out real quick, hey, if I lengthen my gait here, I'm more efficient. So now, you know, you can do all your stretching and activation what we want you to do. But think about now when they spend three, five, seven minutes on the skill mill, now they're getting additional repetitions of that instead of going on maybe another piece of equipment and not reinforcing those movement patterns. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, we're lucky we have we have a, uh, a skill mill here. And, and I know the times that I've been on it, one, well, it, you know, it, it, it is a lot of work, you know, because you can, it is much more difficult than a, a motorized treadmill because you have to force that belt to move, you know, especially when you pick up the resistance. And I've noticed it in my own gait, like, oh, my gait cycle has gotten, my gait strides have gotten a bit longer, and I feel that push-off phase, right? You have to push yep. off, and it's, yep. it's, it's, it, it does, it, it intrinsically teaches you how to go through that full extension to push with your glutes, push with your calves, to propel it, yourself. So and the beauty of that is think what happens neurologically, right? So not only are you doing it, you're rewiring the brain to understand that's how you want to move. And, you know, one of my favorite clients I've trained, I had so many great ones, but it was an individual who, you know, was, has done an amazing job fighting with his Parkinson's. And I would do kind of my own little science. I'd have him walk on a motorized and then walk on a non-motorized. And his gait just dramatically improved. And for an extended period of time, he would tell me, yeah, for a couple hours, my gait improved, my gait improved. So he would come in and just want to get on the skill mill every day because of that neurological connection, you know, now obviously, you know, he's got a, a condition that, you know, he's going to have to constantly you know, battle that. But again, it was another tool and it forced him one to want to do more cardio, which is very important for, for that demographics. And it was engaging and he saw benefits to it. 
you know, it, it gave him a, a more hope, right? So sometimes we take these things, you know, for granted when we don't have uh, a struggle. But when you take a client who's been struggling, you know, can change things like that. It's such a powerful thing, and we do that every day in this industry. That's awesome. I have two more questions for you, Marty, and then we'll get to the uh, promotional giveaway. The first one is, uh, what is the difference in foot contact time in motorized versus non-motorized treadmill? Okay. That's a, a wide-ranging answer, and again, I'll be happy to. They'll have my email address because we can be talking about sprinting versus run, you know, cardiovascular like longer distance running mechanics because there's going to be a difference. So, and then again, individual, right? An efficient runner versus a non-efficient runner. So, the, all of those factors have to be taken into account. But when we look at the skill mill and we're looking at performance-based running, which is more speed and power, we know that there's more contact time in the rear foot, which improves that triple extension. When you're running for distance and long distance, we want a higher turnover rate, more strides per minute, where you're not really looking for that full extension because you're trying to conserve energy and you want you know, a shorter stride. But now we're talking about a sport versus human performance and proper mechanics. So, you know, it's a little complex, but basically we got to look at individual versus individual. And then we have to look at, are you sprinting or are you running for distance? But the key factor and the key takeaway is on the skill mill, the curve non-motorized, you get that extended triple extension and longer ground contact time on the rear foot. And that actually equates to less impact in force. Makes sense. Okay. Very cool. Last question, Marty. Uh, is non-motorized treadmill recommended for ACL rehab? Like maybe that question comes from the video that you're showing. Now, now, clearly, you know, in the fitness industry, we're working with people who have finished up with rehab, but um, definitely with, if you wear that hat as a athletic trainer like myself, physical therapist, absolutely. We have, uh, have skill mills in quite a few different rehabilitation centers because of everything we talked about. Their application might just be a tiny bit different because, you know, of their background. But, you know, when you have somebody that, you, let's say you had somebody that had an ACL tear five years ago, and if they didn't rehab fully or they haven't done their stuff, they're probably going to have faulty movement patterns. It would be very important to get someone that had an ACL tear on a skill mill, especially if they still want to be doing dynamic things, because you know, we know statistically they're at a higher risk if they had surgery once. But then if you take one that's got the chance of ACL injuries, right, we know all that from youth, female athletics especially, get them on these type of pieces of equipment to help develop that proper mechanics for the lower body, the acceleration, and especially doing some walking and sprint intervals where you're really making them decelerate. You're doing them a huge, huge service because we know that that's where the risk of ACL tears will occur. Yeah, and also the auto-correcting feature, mm -hmm. of, right? So now I'm learning proper gait mechanics. Absolutely. By, if I had somebody that displays lots of knees, that would get for some poor movement pattern. Yep. Getting to form a gait pattern that is more biomatic, biomechanically correct. Absolutely. Definitely help. I, I could even see the, the, the skill mill or non-motorized treadmills in a, more of a cardiovascular rehab as well. Correct. Yeah, if you really think about it, because, you know, generally the age of people that are coming off cardio, cardiovascular uh, need the rehab, more of a senior population. So now, again, remember the term accidental exercise, you're improving their gait, you're improving their cardiovascular work, and you're improving their cognitive. You know, I know they're there for, quote unquote, the cardiac rehab, but why not get everything else in at the same time? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Some time on that. Yeah, this, is, this has been wonderful. This has been a wonderful webinar. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. The last thing we want to do is uh, discuss the giveaway. So it's uh, save 30% on PBS programs with just $25 down, no payments till February. Use the promo code webinar15. This is uh, phone only. So uh, if you want to uh, purchase the PBS or the Performance Enhancement Specialist program, um, just call the 800 number there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but we do have one giveaway winner for the PES self-study enrollment. Uh, the winner is Stephen Kiesling. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. So Stephen, congratulations. You just won a, a PES program. Um, so it's a wonderful advanced specialization. I think you'll love it. Both Marty and myself, we're both PES certified. So uh, congratulations, Stephen, for, Stephen, for winning the PES self-study. 
Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Marty, it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I hope we get to do something like this again in the future. Yeah, thank you both with NASM and for everyone that attended. I really appreciate you carving out some time in your busy schedules and happy holidays to everybody and 2020 is right around the corner. Looking Absolutely. forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care, everybody.